So, thank you all. Sure, thank you for the invite here. The opportunity to talk about talk about lessons that uh, I've learned from uh, various people, Stuart uh, and others. Uh, let me just uh, reintroduce who I am. I'm uh, Morris Boston. Butch is my nickname. I am a 40-year uh, federal government uh, servant at different agencies, and I, I've spent the past 16 years uh, on the, in the private sector side consulting back with government agencies. So here's my bit. Uh, when I got my doctorate under uh, Stewart and the other colleagues at GW, I was exposed to general systems theory on Stewart's side, and I was exposed to basically the interpretive frame of reference from the other part of my doctorate, which was chaired by Mike Harmon. I don't know where he is at the present time. About two years ago, I got exposed to complexity theory. Um, and so what, what I want to talk about today are, are what I call a three-legged stool. Uh, uh, general systems, specifically the law of requisite variety, uh, complexity theory, and uh, reflexivity. Reflexivity is basically uh, being aware of the lens that you're using to uh, view the problems. What, what I've been trying to do for the past however many years is to try to take these theories into the government agencies that I've been trying to help, uh, both on the public sector side as a, as a manager and on the private sector side as a consultant, and say, what, what can I do with these things? What can I do with law of requisite variety? What can I do with the idea of um, uh, complexity science? And what can I do with the idea of uh, reflexivity to actually help these people on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and, I, and I've got to say, for the most part, I found out two things. One, I can't do much to help them. Uh, the second thing I, I discovered is that they already do these things. They just don't call them, call them the same language that we call them in academia. Uh, so the first handout that I gave you is just a one sentence description of what we mean by law of requisite variety. Um, lots of for those of you who are not familiar with the law of requisite variety, uh, my, my favorite explanation is uh, if you're a, a football coach and you're, uh, you're coaching the defensive team and you're trying to stop the offense from scoring touchdowns, the offensive coordinator probably has 100, 200 different plays in his offensive playbook. If, as a defensive coach, if you tried to have your defensive team memorize a play for every one of the 200 um, offensive formations, nobody would be smart enough to memorize that playbook. So what, what you do is you establish categories, maybe risk categories, to deal with the, the, the key kinds of offensive plays that they're going to run. You know, like you, you, you establish a defensive uh, formation for uh, the last two minutes of the game. Another one for, uh, if it's going to be a passing kind of situation, or another for the running. So basically what you do is you reduce the number of problems that you have to face to a, a smaller number that you can use to manage the most important things in your environment. So you do that as a football coach, you do that as a law enforcement agency when you establish categories of crime. I worked for FDA for 25 years. They do it when they're reviewing new drugs. They establish categories, you know, high risk categories, medium risk categories, low risk categories, and they develop a strategy to address each of those categories. So to me, basically, it means when you're establishing a law of requisite variety in a federal agency, you're trying to manage your most significant risks by matching a strategy to each of those risks. You can't do it if you do it for every kind of risk, you'll fall down 
you'd be overwhelmed by your own managerial capacity. If you try to, to establish too few categories, you won't respond to the, the needs that you really need to respond to. And to me, that's a, a general rule. In, in that spreadsheet that I've given you, I've tried to show examples of uh, three agencies that I've worked for for more than six years each uh, and, and what, what they try to do, what their problems are, and what their remedies may be. So the second, uh, the second uh, leg of the stool would be uh, <coughs> complexity. I'm, I'm fairly new to the uh, area of complexity theory. I've, I've tried to get smarter in the past two years, but, but to me the key words, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, it, they are complexity theory is based on the idea that uh, there's nobody at the top leading the charge to solve the problem. There are a bunch of individual actors or agents who are interacting, um, sharing information, um, uh, adapting, um, and solutions at whether you want to call it the edge of chaos or uh, a phase transition, complex solutions to complex problems emerge and uh, not through any organized attempt to have them emerge. And so when you apply these to federal agencies, you're finding things like uh, in new drug discovery, uh, research on new molecular entities are occurring all over uh, the globe and solutions to things, for example, the coronavirus, are, are going to happen, but they're not going to be orchestrated by any one leadership. They emerge, uh, and they may be very random for a long period of time until there's a, there's a, a discontinuity that, that happens where, where a solution emerges. And you can see it in all of the examples that I mentioned here. You can also see it in uh, things like uh, 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 movements that are suddenly suddenly take fire, like the Me Too movement. Um, <coughs> so the whole, the whole point on complexity theory is that it's, it's a complex, not complicated, but a complex adaptive system that uh, arrives at solutions through extensive interaction and a few decision rules that uh, uh, actors that are adjacent to each other operate. A classic example is a flock of birds. How does a flock of birds stay together with no one leader? They stay together with two or three basic decision rules. Uh, keep up with your neighbor. Um, fly as close to your neighbor as you can without bump, and don't crash into your neighbor. And with those three decision rules, the flock uh, manages to get together, avoid pred uh, predators, etc. So. That's a, a really primitive understanding of complexity, but when you apply it to federal agencies, uh, what, what, so now you have law of requis requisite variety and complexity theory sort of bumping up against each other because law of requisite variety says the manager needs to control the risks in his or her environment by establishing uh, a priority for what they're going to address first. That implies that the manager can do that. Complexity theory and I'm open to discussion on this, says basically you can't manage your way to a complex solution that it emerges. And, and the best that you might be able to do is um, facilitate the process, uh, uh, maybe have some initial decision rules that, that guide how actors inter interact with each other, but it's presumptuous to think that you can arrive at complex solutions to com complex problems with, with charismatic leadership or even organizational leadership because it just plain doesn't work when you have really complex problems. Now, I want to hear your, your reaction to that, too, as, as we go around. And the third uh, leg of the stool is reflexivity, which in plain and simple terms means uh, you, you've got to understand the lens that you're viewing the world with. You've got to understand the story that you become used to telling about the world, the narrative that makes you feel more comfortable in understanding the world around you. And it's painful to abandon that narrative because when you abandon that narrative, 
your sense making mechanism sort of goes awry and, and the tendency is not to accept things new things that don't fit into your narrative so these are the three lessons for uh, managers in uh, the federal agencies that I've been working with try to establish risk priorities based on requisite variety number one number two understand that you're not the only person in the game that you're one agent among many agents and that you may not have as much influence over the, the solution to the problem as you may think you have. And number three, be self-aware of uh, how, how, how you're viewing the world and go through some kind of epoche or phenomenological reduction to really understand the, uh, the lenses that you're viewing the world through. And, and the rest of this, folks, is just examples that I've tried to draw from uh, Food and Drug Administration that I worked for for 24 years, uh, Bureau of Indian Education, and I worked for BIA for around six years, and uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which uh, I've been with for the past seven years. I've been with other agencies, but I don't have to go through all of these examples, but it, the way this is organized is the three legs of the stool. Uh, attempts to establish requisite variety at each of these three agencies, what the problems that are occurring if you don't establish the, the right uh, combination of strategies and some possible remedies. And the middle three columns uh, have to do with complexity and how complexity is addressed at each of these three agencies. And the last three columns have to do with the third leg, which is reflexivity and how these agencies have tried to do that. In some cases, uh, they need to improve how they do that. Uh, I don't want to go into any more detail than that because I'd rather get participation from you all. What do you think about the concept of the... I'm a practitioner trying to apply these three concepts on a day-to-day -day basis. And the only other thing I would say is that, what I said at the outset, that I think all managers understand these three ideas. Uh, they don't use the terminology that we use. So I'm not sure what I'm doing here is describing what actually goes on or, or prescribing something that should happen. All I know is I feel comfortable that these are three really important <coughs> aspects of, of managing a federal agency. Uh, and uh, how they fit together, not so well sometimes, but uh, I wanted to get a reaction about the, that general framework. What, what, what do you feel about it? Uh, am, I hitting on, I'm hitting, am I hitting on three important parts of how federal programs or any programs run? Am I missing a leg? Uh, um, are there other legs that should be added or subtracted? So I just want to generate a discussion. You can look at the examples and agree or disagree with them. That's my pitch.